Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2013 PESIC Colloquium on Sustainable Agriculture. My name is Matt Liebman. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege tonight to welcome our speaker, Professor David Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery leads the geomorphology research group in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. His work focuses on the natural and social forces that have shaped the surface of the Earth and on environmental history. He's the author of three books reflecting these interests to date. King of Fish, The Thousand Year Run of Salmon, which was published in 2003. Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, published in 2007. And The Rocks Don't Lie, A Geologist Investigates Noah's Flood, which was published last year. Dr. Montgomery's excellence and originality in scholarship and communications were widely recognized in 2008 when he became a recipient of the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Award. I'm extremely pleased that he can be with us tonight to discuss soil erosion, a topic of great importance here in Iowa and globally. The subject of Dr. Montgomery's presentation is especially well suited to the Pesic Colloquium, which honors the work, commitment, and contributions of John Pesic, Iowa State University Emeritus Professor of Agronomy and a soil scientist of international renown. Dr. Pesic's work in soil fertility and other areas led scientists to a better understanding of the effects of agricultural management practices, not just on crop production, but also on the environment. Dr. Pesic also addressed in considerable depth and breadth the challenges and diverse paths to agricultural sustainability. Dr. Montgomery's visit to Iowa State University has been made possible by the work of Ms. Marcia Muneer. It's also been made possible by generous donations from the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, Practical Farmers of Iowa, the Departments of Agronomy, Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology, and Geological and Atmospheric Sciences, the ISU Graduate Program in Sustainable Agriculture, the ISU Plant Sciences Institute, and the ISU Committee on Lectures funded by GSB. On behalf of the PESA Colloquium Committee, I express my sincere thanks to all members of these organizations for their assistance and support. I should say that at the conclusion of tonight's lecture and question period, there will be a small reception over there, and there will be a book signing for uh, the three books that I mentioned by Dr. Montgomery. Please join me in welcoming him to Iowa State University. Well, um, thank you all for coming tonight. This is a, a wonderful room, and it's, it's wonderful to see such a fabulous turnout. Um, it's a real honor to come and speak at the PESIC, uh, to give this PESIC lecture this year, um, in part because I'm not a soil scientist. I'm a geologist uh, by training. And so the first thing that I really want to do is not apologize for the title of my book, Dirt. I'm fully aware that you are never, ever supposed to call soil dirt. I was taught this by the guy who taught me soil science. He, it was a sin to basically say that in that class. And uh, you know, my two defenses about why I would title a book about the importance for soil for civilization dirt is, one, once soil is eroded off of a farm field and it goes somewhere where it was not created, it is a sin. It has become dirt. Once it's eroded, it has been transformed. That's my intellectual defense. My other defense is that my publisher really didn't like the idea of writing a book called Soil, the stuff we all really need. Um, <laughs> so with that non-apology to start, let me give you the real reason that a geologist like myself, trained in hard rock geology, would write a book about why soils are essentially what I like to consider our most fundamental yet underappreciated resource. Um, and that is, I really came, have come to see as, as a geomorphologist, the kind of geologist who studies the evolution of topography, what shapes the surface of the earth that we know and walk around on, um, I've really come to see over several decades of research on that, that soil is truly a strategic resource. It affects human societies in ways that most of us really don't fully appreciate. And yet soil degradation is also probably one of the biggest 21st century environmental crises that is wildly underappreciated. What do we tend to think of as strategic resources? Well, oil, obviously, in a geopolitical way. We tend to think of perhaps the atmosphere as a strategic resource if we're worried about climate change, as we should be. 
And we tend to think about water as a strategic resource in terms of a resource that is not quite in as abundant a supply as a fresh water, as in a, its fresh state as we might like as a, uh, as a globally dominant species now. Soil is the resource that's just as fundamental as those others, but that we tend to take essentially for granted. And it's my contention, and I'm not the first by any means to make this argument, that soil degradation really is a major under, underappreciated crisis that is going to, has had and is going to have global effects that will affect human societies. Now, if we look at the extent of soil degradation globally today, this is a ma the map behind me is uh, the UN's map of soil degradation. It's painting with a very broad brush at a global scale, but you'll notice there's an awful lot of the world, and particularly areas where there's a lot of people, uh, that the soil is basically classified as either very degraded or degraded. That in some way has impacted the, the ability of that soil to actually grow the food that we all depend on to maintain society. Now, this is admittedly a very broad brush. There's places within all those red areas that are depicted in the world where you can find farms that are actually building soil rather than losing soil, as I'll go on to talk about a little later. But if you look, the point of this slide is really to make the case that soil degradation is truly a global phenomenon at this point, if you paint with, whether you, if you paint with a fairly broad brush. Well, how significant is that? Well, David Pimentel et al., uh, David Pimentel at Cornell and his colleagues about 20, uh, what is it, one, a while ago, um, <laughs> basically had a paper in bioscience uh, that argued that oh, since the Second World War, um, farmers have abandoned about 430 million hectares of land to crop production on a global basis. Um, that's equal to about one-third of all the present cropland in the world. It's an area about equal to the size of China and India combined. In other words, kind of while nobody was really watching and thinking at a global scale, we've managed to reduce the area that we are growing food on by about a third at the same time that our population has risen dramatically. And if you think about the problem of feeding the world later this century, whether you want to think about 2050 or 2100, it would sure be handy if we had that one-third of the world's cropland in a state that had its full allotment of native soil fertility. Um, how fast are the world's topsoils eroding? Uh, well, if you put the context in the global uh, framework, their estimates of global soil loss in excess of soil production was on the order of 23 billion tons per year of topsoil that's moved off cropland to go I mean, to be moved to somewhere else. Not all of it reaches the sea. Uh, in fact, very little of it does. It's a whole other problem. Um, but that equates to something less than a 1% topsoil inventory loss per year, about 0.7% according to Pimentel et al. Even if they're off by a factor of two. That kind of a rate may seem really slow, but to a geologist it's really fast. Because basically if you, pen, if you run these numbers out, that means that quite literally within 150 years we're going to exhaust the world's topsoil off of our cropland. Now, I don't actually think that's going to happen because there's lots of other cultural, social, and economic interplays that will come in to prevent our to running out of dirt, if you will, as one reviewer of my book basically accused me of sounding the warning alarm on. Um, but it's like we're not going to ever run out of oil either. What's going to happen is that as it becomes scarcer, it's going to become more valuable. And if you think about the sort of rate of topsoil loss globally, at the time when the human population continues to increase, it makes no sense to be continually degrading our ability to grow food into the future. Because eventually, those curves will intersect, and Malthus will have been proven to have had a point after all. Um, now, essentially, what's the key kind of message that I want to get across in the book? Well, it's not that soils are eroding globally. That, I think, is known. But I wanted to essentially ask the question of what's the role of soil erosion in setting the longevity of human societies? Um, I'm a bit of a history buff. I wanted to look back at the history of past societies. And when you do, there's really no mystery that things like climate change, natural disasters, and politics, war, and social evolution actually influenced ancient societies. I mean, if you look at climate change, you need to look no further than the Viking colony in Greenland that got froze out during the Little Ice Age when there was a cold snap and they couldn't maintain their society there with, when their economic ties to Scandinavia were broken and they blinked out as an incipient society. Similarly, there were dynasties in Egypt that were done in by extended periods of drought that reduced the flow in the Nile to the point that they agriculturally collapsed. Um, so there's no doubt that climate changes can actually do in societies. Um, 
In terms of natural disasters, I've got a picture of Mount St. Helens up there because I'm from Washington State. It was our, you know, the natural disaster in my own backyard. Um, but it's to remind me to talk about the Greek island of Santorini. It was a Bronze Age civilization that basically built a beautiful uh, city on an active volcano in the middle of the Mediterranean, sited about where that explosion would be happening if it was analogous to Mount St. Helens because what happened to Santorini? Well, they had wonderful geothermally plumbed hot water in the Bronze Age. So they had this wonderful flowering of a very technologically, for their age, advanced society with great luxury and wealth because they controlled shipping in the Mediterranean, but they had horrible geological foresight. They basically built on an active volcano, and when that volcano erupted, their society ended. And I use them as an example of how a natural disaster can end a, a human society, in part because it's a great example, but also to make the point that vulnerability to natural disasters at a societal level is scale dependent. If you have a singular island state sitting on an active volcano, when that volcano goes, you're out of business. On the other hand, if you have, say, a major city that's impacted by a major hurricane, it is possible, at least in principle, to bring aid from other areas to bear on that area. In other words, if you have a large nation or a global society, there's, a, there's an intrinsic resilience to sort of natural disasters that happen regionally it, should we choose to practice that socially. Which brings us to the third impact uh, on societies that we would find in all sort of history textbooks, and that's politics, war, and social evolution. People are sort of notoriously bad about you know, sharing land and toys with, with their neighbors over long periods of time. Uh, and I'm not trying to argue that these influences have not shaped the course and fate of human civilizations. Obviously, they have. But what I wanted to ask in this book is what about the role of soil? What about the way that people treated the land? Um, because after all, the fundamental condition for maintaining an agricultural civilization, as darn near all civilizations have been, uh, is sustaining the soil itself as a physical body and its fertility. I'm gonna, and I write in the book about sort of both as parallel concepts. I'll talk a little more tonight about just preserving the soil as a physical body, get into fertility a little in the end. But I wanted to essentially explore that issue. And when you do, if you look back at environmental history textbooks that you can sort of go to the library and check out from the sort of standard sources, uh, you'll run into the argument that soil erosion resulting from deforestation was influenced the demise of ancient civilizations around the world. All those societies over on the right-hand side are places where people have made the argument that soil erosion was a contributing factor to the demise of the society, but almost always you find that the cause is listed as simply as deforestation. The idea that you cut the trees down and the soil erodes away. Now, I'm from, uh, I've lived most of my life on the west, the sort of mountainous terrain on the, the western edge of North America, and I cut my geomorphological teeth studying soil erosion from, deep, from uh, timber management practices in the Oregon Coast Range. Steep 45 degree slopes, the idea that when you cut the trees down, you lose the root strength, the soil can slide off the hill. It's actually a good idea. You get a ba major increase in landsliding after you uh, clear cut steep slopes, no matter what certain industries may sort of advertise in the public media in Washington State. Uh, but you also, if you run the numbers, you can't possibly explain the wholesale loss of the soil for simply deforestation. You get small areas of greatly accelerated erosion, but the trees grow back within a decade, enough to start retarding erosion. So you, if you go in and clear cut a whole area of 45 degree slopes, you get a window of a decade or two where you're very vulnerable to a certain amount of erosion on a small part of the landscape. Now, if you're worried about, say, endangered salmon, which my first book was about, that's a big issue because what does sediment do? It goes downhill. Where do the fish live? In the streams downhill. But if you're thinking about the problem of essentially the wholesale loss of soil off of broad regions of topography, you run the numbers and you really can't blame deforestation. It just doesn't add up. That brought me to sort of starting to ask the question as I looked into the history of ancient societies, as could agriculture have actually been the real culprit? Could it have been the plow that followed the ax that was responsible for the wholesale loss of soil across regions of the ancient world that impacted societies? Now, if the answer to the following question was no, then I probably wouldn't have written my book. So you already am telegraphing the answer. Um, but the question I wanted to investigate was, could agricultural soil erosion and degradation limit the lifespan of civilizations? And what I want to offer you is a bit of uh, uh, observations on the way that a geologist like myself would approach that problem, uh, a bit of the evidence from the archaeological world that I was able to pull together to try and start addressing that, and then also share some of the data that I was able to pull together from more modern studies that essentially back up the contention, again, or I wouldn't have actually bothered to publish the book, um, 
and then try and talk a bit about the yeah, ways that we might actually try and not repeat the same uh, experiment that ancient societies have already run should we actually uh, choose to, to learn the lesson of those societies. So let me first invite you to think about soil the way a geomorphologist does. Um, basically, you can think of it as the, the thin skin of the earth, the interface between biology and geology, if you want to. Uh, what a lot of geomorphologists would, would sort of frame it around is that you can think of it as a system that's produced, stored, and lost. We like to think in those terms. And if you think about soil as produced from the weathering of rocks over there on the right-hand side, Rocks get broken down into smaller bits, get, they get chemically transformed into different kinds of minerals. It gets mixed with biological matter, the roots of trees, fallen leaves, organic matter. You put those two things together and you have soil. Uh, you can think of soil on a hillside as the standing stock of soil that reflects the balance between that rate of soil production and also the rate of erosion. And if you have any kind of a sloping surface, you know, fraction of a degree on up to about 45 degrees, and you don't get much soil over 45 degrees because it just won't stay there, um, and which is why most cliffs tend to be made out of bedrock. Um, but <laughs> essentially, if you think of soil as that kind of a system where it's produced from weathering, it's lost from erosion, and what you find on a hillside reflects that balance, uh, then you can, you're starting to think of the soil in a way that a geomorphologist does. And you can think about it essentially the way you think about your bank account. You've got income, that's equal, the, the, the analogy to weathering. You've got your expenses, that's your erosion. You have savings, I hope, some savings in the bank that is essentially the magnitude of, uh, you can think of soil on a hillside as our natural, our collective natural savings account. And having run the the experiment of spending money a lot faster than I make it several times now in my life, I can testify that if you do that for long enough, you run out of money. Soil is no different. It's really no different. It's got that same input minus output equals change in storage. If you're eroding soil faster than you're building it, you are burning up your agricultural savings account. And the question is how long can it go on for? That's the real pertinent question to the, to the question that I, I want to look at in terms of framing this book. Are the rates enough to actually let it uh, add up enough over long enough periods of time? Um, well, if we think of soil as a system, uh, the other thing we need to think about is how diverse is it? They're incredibly diverse. There's several hundred thousand specific different kinds of soils on this planet. There's probably you know, multiple types on most farms in most parts of the world. Why? Well, because under native vegetation, you get a typical kind of soil with a typical thickness that develops that reflects the local climate, vegetation, topography, and geology, four of Hans Jenny's famous factors of soil formation. The other is that it takes time for soils to form as well. Um, the point being is that they're incredibly diverse. They're, there's not sort of one kind of soil in the world. They're very locally adapted. Now, with those two things in mind, let's ask the question of, well, what might be the mechanism that would connect agricultural practices to the wholesale loss of soil across regions? And I think the answer is fairly simple, the plow. Uh, if you look at the invention of the plow um, as connected to agricultural soil loss around the world, um, it's fairly well connected. Why? Well, what happens when you basically, well, what, what does a plow do? It basically turns the earth and leaves it bare for some portion of the period of a year. How, you know, until the next crop comes out. And there's very strong reasons why you might want to do that to a field in terms of growing a crop for the next year, depending on the soil and the climate that you're in and so forth, or, or the society and the technological level that you have access to. Um, but the simple fact is, is that how many places in the world have you ever been to that was a native grassland or a native forest where you saw bare soil at the surface of the earth? There's not many places. It's the arid regions of the world where you tend to find soils that don't have a, th a soil cover. There's a, been a positive feedback ever since land plants evolved where the growth of plants fed the, the shielded soils from erosion that promoted the development of soils that essentially fed plants. And plowed fields erode far faster than soils are made. I'll show you data that, that verifies that in a little bit. But essentially, what did the invention of the plow do? It altered that balance between the production and loss of soil on the lands that we tend to grow food on. Um, and this has a, triggered a problem that has plagued societies, both ancient and continues to plague modern society. Um, and it's a fairly simple and ancient connection. There's, and there's a bit of an irony there because essentially the invention of the plow and then the decision to actually um, hook it up to uh, animals to essentially increase the ability of individual farmers to feed more people led to the development of Western civilization. And we would not be sitting here in a room as grand as this with technology like this if we hadn't embarked on that technology thousands of years ago. Um, but it came at a price that not many of us intentionally uh, tend to recognize. And that's the degradation of land that has d d um, done in many of the regions of the world where farming originated. Um, 
I want to use uh, classical Greece as a, a major example of this. Um, I go through many examples in the book, all that I could find. I tried to be pretty encyclopedic because that's what I'm trained to be. Um, but I want to just give you a couple examples from history because I don't want to talk till midnight. And the basic story is often the same in society after society. In classical Greece, for example, cycles of erosion and soil formation began in the Bronze Age, several thousand years before the time of Christ, um, right after the introduction of plow-based agriculture. The plow arrived from the Middle East. It came to the Greek landscape. At that time, it was open oak woodland. This is sort of a typical cross-section of a hill uh, put together by Tiered Van Andel and Chris Runnels back in the 1980s when I was um, finishing college. And basically, they uh, re uh, reconstructed this as open oak woodland where you had about a one to three foot thick soil on the hillsides. And when the plow arrived, cultivation essentially spread from the valley bottoms up onto the hillsides. Why from the valley bottoms? Well, that's where you had relatively flat, relatively easily worked land that was watered by rivers. And as the population grew, farming essentially spread up onto the hillsides, and the clock started ticking as plowing started to um, leave the soils vulnerable to erosion on the hillsides where annual flooding was not replenishing the soil like it does on a floodplain. And so as grain spread up onto the hillsides of ancient Greece, over time, the soils are stripped off and they ended up down concentrated in the valley bottoms. And Van Ailes and Runnels had done the geology and the archaeology to put this story together for parts of, of southern Greece. Uh, they would find things like um, agricultural implements for growing wheat that were up on the hillsides where there wasn't any soil left, where you couldn't possibly grow wheat today. And they put the basic story together. Now, you, most of the soil actually ended up down in the valley bottoms. It didn't make it out in the Mediterranean. And so the total volume of soil in the landscape didn't change all that much. But the problem, of course, is that the process of farming doesn't depend on the volume of soil in the landscape. It depends on the surface area. If you take it from a, a large area in a thin layer and pile it up into a thick pile at the valley bottoms, you've reduced the area that you can actually use to support the population. How big a deal was this in classical Greece? Um, well, again, Van Andels and Runnels uh, published a figure that actually got me started on writing this book. And that was when, they, uh, uh, when I saw this figure in their work, where they looked at the population density of the southern Argolid, a particular region in southern Greece, f since 6,000 BC over there on the left over to about now on the right. And they, you basically notice a couple aspects of these curves. Uh, there's sort of two fundamental aspects to this curve that I, th I think are interesting. One of them is really trivial, and the other is, I think, incredibly important. So let's start with the trivial one. So always, always do that, right? <laughs> um, what's tri what, you get this population that runs up in the Bronze Age when agriculture was introduced. It crashes for a few thousand years. It runs up in the Classical Age. It crashes again, and then it runs up in the Modern Age. The trivial part of this curve is the amplitude of those cycles. You could support more people per hectare of land each time society came back. Why? Well, they had better technology. We've got better technology, agricultural technology today than they did in the Bronze Age. It's, it's fairly simple. We can grow more food on the same amount of land. No real debate or argument there. But what sets the periodicity of these curves? Why a run up for a few thousand years, a crash for a few thousand years, and then repeating it over again? And what about off to the right, and is this a possible global analog? There's not many places in the world where there's been three successive agricultural societies occupying the same piece of land. And there's even fewer where the geoarchaeology has been done, um, which is why I like using southern Greece. Um, so, of course, the question is, is this essentially a cautionary tale about what we could be doing globally in terms of soil exhaustion and erosion? Um, and if so, what's going to happen off the far right end of the graph? Well, I'm not the first person to worry about that kind of a connection. It turns out that Plato did. He was writing in the time of classical Greece, right at the peak of that second hump, and he was looking at the problem of soil erosion from the Bronze Age soil erosion event. What was he looking at? He was seeing things like oak trees around farm fields that were sitting on pedestals of soil a meter or so above the surrounding plowed fields. And he sort of connected the dots and went, ah, oh, the soil used to be thicker here. There used to be more soil. And he was complaining about how the landscape was not able to support as many people and raise as large armies as it had in the olden days, the Bronze Age. And he was particularly worried about that because they were trying to keep the Persians out of, out of um, Greece. Uh, the, the passage that he wrote is worth uh, quoting in full uh, in describing this because uh, he wrote that the rich soft soil has all run away, leaving the land nothing but skin and bone. But in those days the damage had not taken place. The hills had high crests and the rocky plain of Thelus was covered with rich soil and the mountains were covered by thick woods of which there are some traces today. He was basically recognizing the, the erosive effects of the Bronze Age soil erosion event 
and complaining about its effect on the Greek population. In other words, he probably deserves credit to be as one of the first geomorphologists. He's not generally recognized as such. Uh, he's generally more recognized, well, the reason he hadn't, didn't get a lot of recognition for this insight, I think, is in part because he wrote it in the dialogue that he wrote about the history of Atlantis, which is not viewed as the most credible of, of classical sources. Um, but I think he really sort of got the short end he, he, of, of the history's stick there. Uh, he made fundamental observations about the world, about the soils, and connected it, and was the first, I think, to basically make the argument that the land can c take care of societies for only as long as conditioned by the way that people take care of the land. It was almost a Leopoldian type of ethic, but from the fourth century BC, and not quite expressed anywhere near as eloquently. Well, let me skip over many societies in between um, and, and not talk about Rome, which had a similar story, or Northern Africa, or the Chinese, or Easter Island, or a whole bunch of places. And let me skip straight to colonial North America. Why? Well, in researching this book, I discovered that soil erosion played a much greater part in the history of the United States and its social and economic and political development than I ever imagined when I started researching the book. Um, why was that? Well, essentially, what got the colonial uh, states going? It was tobacco cultivation. Why tobacco cultivation? Well, because it was the one thing that you could grow in the early colonies and that you could ship back to Europe at a substantial enough profit to basically keep European goods and services coming back on the ships the other way, because tobacco would survive the trip. Um, it could be sold at a great profit. The uh, Spanish had the monopoly on Caribbean tobacco early on. The British Crown, when they figured out that they could grow tobacco in Virginia after they stole some tobacco, um, basically realized it was an incredible tax source because their citizens were becoming addicted to tobacco, buying a lot of it, and they could essentially run their empire off of the tax income. Um, and this kept the colonial states going for a long time until that little tax issue got sort of in the way and led to the creation of our country. Um, the point, though, is that tobacco was an incredibly erosive crop to grow using colonial techniques. You could get about three to five years of, productive, of production out of a piece of land before you needed to clear new land and go on uh, further into the continent. This led to, the pro to essentially the development of, of widespread plantation agriculture uh, because if you essentially, well, there were two other things going on at the time. In North America, land was cheap and labor was expensive. You had to buy your labor. You took your land. In Europe, it was exactly the opposite. Land was really expensive and labor was cheap. They were exporting people like my ancestors as fast as they could get rid of us and send us to the New World. Um, and land was being amalgamated by the upper class into larger and larger holdings. This led to a lot of innovations like crop rotation and, and animal husbandry and mixed um, an investigation of mixed crop cropping and animal husbandry um, and essentially ways to try and restore the fertility of the land. In North America, that wasn't happening. Why? Land was cheap. It was the cheapest input into the agricultural produ pro produ production process. Still, people like George Washington, the guy I have up on the screen now, were very concerned about the effects of colonial erosion on the future of the United States. Uh, why? Well, Washington's quote is worth reading in full for that effect. He wrote, uh, he was complaining of declining crop yields in the late 18th century as soils in the eastern seaboard were exhausted. He wrote that a few years more of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support, whereas if they were taught how to improve the old, instead of going in pursuit of new and productive soils, they would make these acres, which now scarcely yield them anything, turn out beneficial to themselves. Washington was arguing quite explicitly that the future of the United States lay in crossing the Appalachians and in westward expansion of the country, not because of a manifest destiny to civilize the continent. That was reverse engineered at the end of the 19th century. This was basically because he saw the effects of soil degradation on an agricultural society on the eastern seaboard driving American farmers across the Appalachians to get at the good virgin soils on this side of the mountains. Um, he was fairly prescient in that regard. Well, how bad was the soil erosion along the eastern seaboard historically? This map shows you the, um, the Piedmont region um, from work that uh, uh, was uh, put together by Stan Trimble. And basically, that gray noodle shows you the Piedmont. So it's the upland hill country. It's not the coastal plain along the, the sort of plains of North Carolina down to Georgia there. It's not the high mountains in the Appalachians. Um, and yes, I do consider them real mountains. Um, it's the hill country, the Piedmont country, the upland areas that are analogous to, say, southern Greece, the areas where you have a thin soil, one to several foot thick soil naturally over, over, um, over rock. And you'll notice that this map shows you four to 10 inches of soil erosion since the onset of colonial agriculture. There's areas that have greater than 10 inches of erosion. 
Well, is that a big deal or a little deal? There was only 12 inches of thick, fertile, black topsoil in this region to begin with. And so if you basically, and this is fairly well constrained, if you basically accept the idea that a couple hundred years of colonial agriculture, mostly plow-based, moldboard plow-based agriculture, could um, result in enough erosion to basically strip off a third to darn near all the topsoil off of what was originally the agricultural breadbasket of our country, and we could do it in a couple centuries, it starts to put into perspective that the idea that the classical Greeks with a thousand year run at it at a time, or a two thousand year run at it, or the, or the Romans who had a couple thousand year run at central Italy, could actually plow off most of their natural endowment of topsoil over the centuries, happening at a pace that's fairly slow enough that you don't necessarily notice it year to year or perhaps even lifetime to lifetime, but that adds up nonetheless in the end. Um, so this starts to basically give some perspective that maybe this hypothesis that I phrased at the beginning uh, might not be all that crazy after all. Now this is, I'm going to pick on my own home state of Washington here for a few minutes uh, because it's kind of, you know, the, the more ugly the pictures get, the better you, the more it's good to pick on your home. Um, this is the Palouse, it's eastern Washington. Uh, this is a winter wheat field from uh, the 1970s, about 40 years after the establishment of the Soil Conservation Service. And you'll notice all those little channels in the field, uh, rills, things you could plow right over and essentially erase on a yearly basis with a tractor. Uh, are, those are the reasons that a geologist like me would look at this landscape and go, the soil is just bleeding off of it. Um, how fast does it actually happen? Well, in the Palouse, there's a dramatic example that was photographed by Vern Kaiser back in 1961, where he basically took a photograph of, it's again, it's a winter wheat field, that fence up in the upper right-hand corner is a fence that the farmer built around his water cistern in 1911, back when the, um, when the land was up at that level, it's labeled 1911, the original uh, uh, grassland surface before he broke it. The only thing that happened to this field since then was winter wheat, so over the course of 50 years, you essentially eroded off about a five-foot section of soil. There's a little thin black line just, well, just to the, my left up there. You can barely see. It's kind of washed out in the negative, but that's a one-foot interval on a stadia rod, a survey rod. That's about a five-foot cliff. It formed over the course of nothing but sort of rain, that kind of real erosion, rain erosion off of plowed fields for 50 years. So a five feet in 50 years, that's about a foot a decade. That's about an inch a year of topsoil loss. Uh, about 50% of the original topsoil off the whole Palouse has been eroded off in the past century. In other words, we're repeating in eastern Washington virtually exactly what we did on the eastern seaboard of the United States. We're on track. So now, of course, that example from the Palouse is an extreme example. That's why I like to use it, right? <laughs> it's extreme. You should be asking yourself, well, how typical is it? And that's exactly what I was asking myself. And so I did something that has, has kind of gone out of fashion a little bit, um, and I basically uh, took several weeks in the, um, in the summer when my graduate students were all off doing their own work, and I basically just went to the library, and I vacuumed up all the data I could find on rates of topsoil loss, and lo both short-term under ag different agricultural systems and also long-term geological rates of topsoil loss. Because if you buy that argument that over the long run, rates of soil formation and soil erosion in a natural environment will be roughly balanced. And it's a pretty good argument because if you have geologic time to work with, if they're out of balance, you'll either like build an incredibly thick soil or you'll strip it all off to bedrock pretty fast. Um, I basically compiled all the data that I could find. And so what did I actually find? And I also wanted to basically test with real numbers whether this hypothesis that you could erode enough soil off of the landscape agriculturally over a reasonable period of time that it was relevant to looking at the lifespan of human civilizations. So basically, I found 1,400 studies. Why did I stop there? Well, I ran out of time. School started again. Um, I had to start lecturing and doing things that you know, I actually make my living doing. Um, and so I, I did not include any data from sediment yield studies. You know, I didn't look at what's coming out of a river basin. I looked at point source losses. Um, why? Well, because stuff can get stored on the way down through a river system. And I didn't look at any universal soil loss equation uh, based studies. I didn't look at any modeling based studies. I wanted to just look at real data. Um, and so what did I find? Basically four different kinds of data are up there. Um, there's uh, first notice that it's a one axis plot. It's basically just showing you erosion rate for different places in the world. And you'll notice it runs over about seven logarithmic cycles. Over there on the far left-hand side, there's erosion rates that are at less than a ten-thousandth of a millimeter a year. And if anybody can figure out a really solid way to measure in real time 
erosion at a ten thousandth of a millimeter of a year. Please let me know. <laughs> I haven't been able to figure that out. Um, there's ways to integrate it over geologic time, but over there on the right, basically the far right, you see erosion rates that are up to more than 10 millimeters a year, decimeter a year kind of rates. Those are erosion rates that you get, say, at the bottom of the Tsangpo Gorge, the biggest, most erosive gorge in the high Himalaya. It's incredibly fast. To a geologist, you know, a centimeter a year is screamingly fast. Um, so first thing, erosion rates are really variable all over the planet. Um, there's not sort of one simple number. Second thing is if you take those three white data sets, the next three levels up, uh, those show you the data I found for long-term geological erosion rates, and I've stratified by three different kinds of environments. There's cratons. What's a craton? It's not something that is in a salad. It is something that is in the middle, the flat middle part of a continent. So we're sitting on a craton here, the heart of Africa, the Amazon basin. Um, you know, it's basically places without a lot of relief, so low slopes. They erode fairly slowly, in great part because they're relatively flat. Um, and by relatively, I work in the high Himalaya, so I have a whole different sort of sense of what's flat and what's steep. Um, but cratons erode up to rates of like 1% of a millimeter a year, really slowly, in other words. Soil mantled terrain, the next level up, places that erode up to over about a millimeter a year. What's that like? It's like the rolling hills of California. It's probably like the steepest terrain in, in Iowa. It's like, um, uh, well, it's like the Piedmont in the southeast. Uh, they erode places up to about a millimeter a year. And if you think about long-term soil production as being balanced with erosion, you can start to see that the places that we would actually farm at a global level, the cratons and soil mantled terrain, places that are not the alpine and glaciated high mountains like that third data set, which are things like the high Himalaya, like the Alps, like the Cascades, places with a lot of bedrock, not much soil, and steep slopes, places you wouldn't think of farming unless you had no other land. Um, if you look at that, the long-term soil erosion rates in any place we would consider farming globally are less than a millimeter a year. What are the USDA soil loss tolerance values that are used to define sustainable agriculture? Well, they can be about half a meter to a millimeter a year. In other words, they're slammed to the far right-hand side of any place of the long-term erosion rates that we would normally consider farming. In other words, even if you follow those, it's not necessarily sustainable. Um, the black data sets up at the top are the agricultural erosion data. Those are for conventional, and by conventional I mean plow-based agriculture, uh, from anything from small farms in developing nations to fairly large farms in, the, in this country. And if you play the simple game of sort of which of the natural environment erosion rates does the agricultural data um, most resemble, you basically come to the conclusion fairly readily that conventional farms are eroding like steep alpine topography. In other words, we've managed to convert places like Iowa, places like Nebraska, places like Tennessee, into places that are eroding like the high Himalaya, and we've done it on a global basis. And this should be an incredibly sobering realization. It's not something we should be, t it's, it's quite an accomplishment, but it's not something we should necessarily be proud of. Now, that was the bad news slide. Um, now, when you add another axis and a couple other data sets, you can actually turn it into a good news slide, which is what I want to do here. What I've done, I've taken the same data sets, and this time I have erosion rate plotted on the vertical axis, and I'm showing you the full distribution of the data, so it's, it's a basically showing you a distribution function of the data across the bottom. Uh, and the two black lines on it show you the data I just showed you. That upper one is conventional plow-based agriculture. The lower black line is the global geological erosion data for all parts of the world put into a single distribution. So that's how fast the world actually erodes uh, over the long run. Now, what I've added are essentially uh, distributions for erosion rates under native vegetation, um, which is essentially the, uh, the triangles that plot on top of that lower black line and rates of long-term soil production, where people have essentially determined how fast their soil is produced. And that's the other, the other white line, the open circles. Um, and you'll notice that those two lines plot right on top of the long-term geological erosion rate data, or at least pretty close. You could argue about the squiggles, but this is a brute force data comparison, so we're going to call this basically about on top of each other. Now, I'm not going to argue there's any difference between them. Um, and that actually validates that idea that soil production over the long run is balanced by soil erosion over the long run. Why? Well, the curves are about the same. Um, the other bit of data that I have on there is labeled conservation. And what that is is conservation agriculture. So it's essentially agriculture. It's no-till agriculture. It's agriculture that is, is practiced essentially prioritizing soil conservation. Um, you notice that it plots on a global basis right on top of the long-term geological erosion rate data. That's the good news. 
because basically it, it demonstrates that the problem that we have with agricultural soil erosion is not simply the problem that we farm. I mean, if that was the conclusion that I had come to, it would be, you know, what's the answer? Well, it's just like party till you burn the planet up, right? I mean, it's because <laughs> uh, there's no, that would, there'd be no way to solve that. But it turns out that we actually can farm quite intensively in ways that actually do not result in long-term degradation of the soil. Now, there's all the problems with all the different kinds of soils in the world and different places on any individual farm and all that kind of stuff. But if you look at it at a global level, like a geologist would, you can make a credible case that basically we don't have to necessarily repeat the, less, the exercise that ancient societies have gone through. The bad news, of course, is that the methods of conservation-intensive farming that it would take to actually do that are what we call alternative agriculture. Now, if we look at those erosion rates, and, you know, some people don't like looking at distribution functions, so I want to just show you the, the couple at kinds of averages that you can look at with this data before I move on. Um, and that's it's basically all the same data that I vacuumed out of the library. Uh, and this is um, the last real data intensive slide that I'll show you. So if, uh, if you don't like data, you can wake up again in a minute or two. Um, but the Basically, whether you like medians or means, and why do I show you both? Well, they're not symmetric distributions. There's some pretty wild asymmetries to these distributions. Um, but if you look at sort of the pace of uh, conventional plow-based agriculture, on average, we're losing somewhere north of a millimeter a year of soil off of our glo uh, croplands globally. Again, a global average. Now, if you look at rates of erosion under no-till agriculture, they're less than a tenth of a millimeter a year. Again, averaged over all the available studies at the time I compiled this. Uh, you look at erosion rates under native vegetation globally, rates of soil production, long-term rates of geological erosion. Again, it's all less than a tenth of a millimeter a year or so. So in other words, all those blue numbers, I'm going to argue, they're all about the same. They're small, less than a tenth of a millimeter a year. It's that red number that's real different, and it's bigger than those other numbers by a factor of at least a millimeter a year. And I'm being, you know, with what I'm showing you, I'm being fairly conservative. Now, let me show you one other bit of data before I sort of do a little back of the envelope math with that last um, uh, graph. And that is, what's happened, as a geologist, what's happened over geologic time to soil erosion? Well, a guy named Bruce Wilkinson at the University of Michigan a few years ago was audacious enough to actually ask that question and try and reconstruct it. He did a really neat study where he took all the sedimentary rocks in the world and figured out how fast would the mountains, wherever they were, have to have been eroding at what part of geologic time to explain those deposits. What he basically found is that over the last half a billion years, the last 500 million years, the average rate of soil erosion off of a continent was about an inch every 1,400 years or so. What he also, I mean, if you, and if you take the USDA's assertion that the average rate of soil production at present is about an inch every 500 years, which isn't all that far off from the, the mean of the average of the data that I compiled, um, you can basically make the case that um, over time, over the last half billion years, soils have been building in thickness on the surface of the earth the rate of soil production exceeded the rate of soil loss. And that's consistent with the idea that most surfaces over most of the earth have soil on them. What's the average rate of soil erosion at present? If you look globally, it's on the order of about an inch every 60 years or so. In other words, in the last century or two, we've basically flipped this long-term pattern for which the planet was actually building soils to one in which we have been losing soils on a global basis. It's a fun as fundamental a shift in the nature of the surface of the earth as anything you might care to point out which is obviously why I'm pointing it out. Um, now, if you take that net loss of soil from agricultural fields on the order of a millimeter a year or so, and you take that at face value, what does that mean for the hypothesis that I started with, the relevance to the longevity of human societies? Well, let's do the math. If you take the net loss of a millimeter a year or so, it implies that if you have a half meter to a one meter thick pile of soil, one to three foot thick soil on a hillside, which is about the global average for a native soil, you could, you could literally erode through it in 500 to 1,000 years or so. That's approximately the lifespan of most major civilizations uh, outside of the key exceptions, which, of course, are the major river floodplains of the world, places like the Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile, the rivers of China, places where agriculture originally developed, in part subsidized by erosion of the uplands. Why? Well, a, a floodplain gets fertilized year after year with, with the deposition of material during floods, and you can make a very good case that the degradation of land in, in Ethiopia and Somalia essentially fed Egypt for thousands of years. And so the resilience of the societies that existed for thousands of years continuously was in great part because of their physical geography. They were on major river floodplains where they were receiving nutrient supplements from the degraded uplands. 
Well, I'm obviously not the first person to point this out. Walter Loudermilk, a gentleman I never had the, the, the pleasure of meeting, wrote about this 50 years ago, and, or 60 years ago now, in, in 1953, when he wrote that here in a nutshell, so to speak, we have the underlying hazard of civilization. For by clearing and cultivating sloping lands, and most of our lands are more or less sloping, we expose soils to accelerated erosion by water or by wind, and in doing this, we enter upon a regime of self-destructive agriculture. He was on to all this. How did he sort of figure this out? Well, he went to some, looked at some of the same areas I was looking at in terms of Greece, Italy, Northern Africa, Israel, Mesopotamia, places where you don't really think of as agricultural powerhouses today, but that were in the classical world when they still had relatively good soil. Well, so this raises the question of, well, is it possible to reverse uh, soil degradation? Can we reverse this historical pattern? And how would we do that? Well, if the problem arose from our agricultural practices, well, then the answer clearly lies in changing our agricultural practices. That should not be terribly controversial, um, as much as it might be. Um, <laughs> how, how would we do that? Well, we could reduce subsidies for conventional erosive farming practices. Um, you know, from a geological perspective, it makes absolutely no sense at a societal level to be rewarding farmers for practices that degrade the land in its ability to feed future generations. Um, we could increase support for no-till practices on those lands where it's suitable, and I know it's not suitable for every sort of microclimate and every sort of soil type, but it does radically reduce erosion rates. Uh, we could increase subsidies or encouragement for, um, for crop rotations, cover crops. Um, we could promote practices that increase soil organic matter both to sequester carbon and also improve soil fertility. In other words, there's things we could do to our agricultural incentives and disincentives and, and the, the sort of um, uh, the market sideboards, if you will, that exist on any uh, reputedly free market system uh, t that basically can shape people's behavior. Um, but the thing that gives me the most hope is, is not the sort of political will to ever actually do any of those things. It's the fact that we can actually, it's possible to physically rebuild soils surprisingly fast. If you take the rates at which nature rebuilds soils and you say, well, we could build an inch of soil in 500 years, who wants to wait that long? You know, the answer is nobody. But it turns out that there are really good examples of places where with uh, human labor, application of, of labor, resources, and intelligence, we can actually rebuild soils far faster than nature can uh, is something that I actually learned in my wife's garden, where basically we bought a house in North Seattle where the soil had been stripped off back to glacial till when we got it. There wasn't a single worm in our lawn. It was basically sterile. She's a gardener. She got really upset by that. She wanted to restore our soil. It only took her about eight years to rebuild a couple inches of a fairly fertile A horizon and start uh, just sort of a whole explosion of life in our yard that has led to um, an incredibly uh, bountiful um, garden at a place that was just barren less than about a decade ago. Uh, how'd she do it? Well, with the application of labor and organic matter. It's the two p things that we have a surplus of, at least in cities, uh, and it's worth thinking about how we might actually conceivably run the same experiment that a couple ancient societies that proved to be the exceptions to my general model of soil degradation and societal limitation. Um, and the two really good examples of that are, are places that built very fertile carbon-rich soils by anthropogenic activity, where you found the best soil where there was the most people, not the most degradation, but the best soils where there was the most people for the longest time. And the Dutch uh, were a great example of that, something like, what, a third to 40 percent of Holland uh, was basically reclaimed from the sea. They built in the incredibly rich plagen soils. Uh, they're some of the best agricultural soils in Europe. How? By returning urban organic matter back to the land in a very focused program over the course of decades to build new farmland. Um, the, the terra preta soils of the Amazon are the other sort of the great example. There's others in terms of the Inca and some islands in the South Pacific that built soils also. Um, but what are the terra preta soils? Well, if you think about what are the natural soils in a place like the Amazon rainforest, they're incredibly nutrient depleted. It's hot, it's wet, it's flat. So all that hot rainwater, it percolates through the soil, strips out the nutrients. Almost all the nutrients that are in, in play in that ecosystem are in the canopy and the trees, cycling around. So when you clear the forest, you export all the nutrients, you can get four or five years of, of good agriculture, of, of, of subsistence agriculture out of it before you're down to basically trying to farm bedrock, weathered bedrock that is nutrient depleted. Um, doesn't last, in other words. But the best soils in the Amazon are these thick, black, fertile soils called the terra preta soils that are in the areas of very high native inhabitant uh, density. Why? 
because they basically returned all their uh, cooking fires and their ash and their urban wastes back to their fields and over thousands of years built these soils that are almost like potting soil. It's incredibly rich and fertile. In fact, they mine it, dig it up, and ship it to the cities in Brazil and sell it as potting soil. But they basically showed that you can actually improve soils through intensive occupation and, and intensive uh, human density. In other words, people might be the solution, not the problem, if we actually change the way we think and act towards soils. Why would we bother trying to restore soils globally? Well, in my view, it's to address some of the big challenges of the 21st century. I'm not going to go into the details of all four of these. I've got a different talk that can do that, but essentially, Putting carbon back in the ground actually can take a dent out of uh, our atmospheric CO2 emissions. It's not going to solve the CO2 problem by any stretch of the imagination, but it can actually help a lot, surprising amount. Um, restoring soil can actually help feed a post-oil world. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, restoring soils in cities can actually have a big impact on uh, public health, mental health, and physical health, and city livability. And it can also could also help globally with the the, the global biodiversity cross crisis and the problem of environmental degradation. In other words, I don't know of any other single act you could suggest other than restoring soils that would help solve four of the biggest problems we face as a species. Soil restoration would contribute towards all of them. It won't solve any of them, but it will help solve all of them. Um, you know, the problem of feeding a growing population is one I probably don't even need to show a slide to anyone anymore about. We know that we're going to have another three or four billion people in the next 50 or 100 years. Nobody knows what that curve will actually do. The big question is what happens the 100 years to the right of that, obviously. But if you think about how will we uh, feed the world in the future, you quickly run into the problem that we actually, we're not running, going to run out of oil, but we are going to run out of cheap oil. Um, if you basically look at the, the industry's own data in terms of oil production, we're sort of at the peak oil production now, whether we were a few years ago or are a few years from now to a geologist doesn't really matter, we're kind of there. What's going to happen to the price of oil as we run off the right-hand side of that curve? Does anybody think the price of oil will go down in real dollars in the next century? I have only one person has ever raised their hand. Um, and he was a bit of a contrarian, so what can I say? Um, so what's the strategy we've actually used for the last 50 years to maintain agricultural production and feed the first part of the run-up of that global population curve? It's to intensify our use of fossil fuels uh, and of, um, and of, um, and of, of industrial-produced fertilizers to actually keep crop yields up. It's worth asking the question on a societal level of whether we're going to be able to maintain that strategy over the long run as oil supplies dwindle and prices rise dramatically later this century. What's that going to do to fertilizer prices? What has it done to fertilizer prices periodically when there's oil shortages? We know there's a coming global oil shortage, but it's decades over the horizon, and we're not going to literally run out, but it ain't getting any cheaper. And that motivates the question of how are we going to feed a post-oil world without cheap fertilizer-intensive agriculture? If somebody can invent a super clean, abundant, cheap source of energy, well, then the fertilizer problem is going to sort of not be quite as, as central as it will be if somebody doesn't. But it's worth wrestling with the question. And I put an editorial out in Nature a few years ago basically arguing we need to invest globally in what I'd like to call a greener revolution um, that basically and look into the potential for uh, increasing crop yields from uh, no-till and organic agriculture, um, uh, which can convete, compete with conventional agriculture, and particularly some of the lessons from the droughts of the last few years in terms of the resilience of crop yields under no-till uh, from the farmers I've been talking with the last couple of years have been very educational for me. But the other thing is that all, that one-third of global, global cropland that's been degraded since the Second World War, what if we actually restored the soil on it, got it back in production? What if we were able to actually restore its fertility? Um, no matter how one looks at it, though, I think, if you look about at how we're going to feed ourselves in 100 years, or even 200 years, if you really want to think like a geologist, um, it's going to be important to actually restore native soil fertility. Uh, why? Well, because over the long run, it's more efficient, and we'll be able to feed more people that way, um, especially if the cost of energy keeps going up. And I like to advertise that, this, that it, when I argue that, I'm not really trying to make an argument about uh, pitting low-tech organic agriculture versus GMO and agrotech as opposite ends and arguing we have to choose one or the other. What I'm basically arguing, really, is that we have to learn how to apply an understanding of soil ecology to the applied problem of increasing and sustaining, and that's the part we tend to forget about, and sustaining crop yields over the long run, 
in a post-oil world. Why? Well, because we're not going to be able to rely on oil a century from now. So basically, I think it's time for a new view of the soil. Um, you know, if we've, if we've gotten ourselves into the same problem over and over again in societies, um, we, you know, we're not going to solve that problem by thinking about things the same old way. That's my favorite Einstein quote that basically makes that. He was a pretty smart guy. Um, so let's look for a couple minutes uh, about at how we viewed soil as a species over our history. For probably the, the most of our history, we viewed soil as a mystery. We haven't understood it. And in fact, I would argue that there's still many aspects of uh, soil microbiology that are almost as mysterious to us now as the basic problem of fertility was millennia ago. Um, and this is the Greek goddess of cereal, Ceres, just in case you're wondering who you're looking at there. Um, but so most of our, for, for most of our experience as a species, soils were a mystery, something that was personified, deified, something to be revered. Um, Still today, and for, again, most of our existence as an agricultural species, the soil was a means to a living. The land was meant to, was uh, something to be worked. And this is just to illustrate that the technology of plows haven't changed much since Mesopotamia, up there in the upper right, down to uh, the modern age. Come the Middle Ages, uh, come the, the Renaissance, soil became to be viewed as a decipherable mystery. It was something that could be studied, it could be understood. Uh, Leonardo wrote that we know more about the movement of the celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. Sadly, that's as true today as it was 500 years ago. In the 19th century, we started to view soil as a chemical reservoir, the whole idea that you could just add fertilizers as needed to make up for the, what was limiting crop production became really the dominant view of, uh, that fed the agrochemical model that is still uh, essentially practiced globally today. Um, and, and soils were essentially viewed as something to hold the plants up as we fertilized them. Uh, come the 21st century, so it increasingly came to be viewed as an industrial commodity. It was sort of the cheapest input to the agricultural production pro process in the industrialization of agriculture. And what do you do with the cheapest input to any commodity production process? You don't worry about wasting it. It's the cheapest input. And that, I would argue to you, is essentially what has happened to soils over the 20th, 20th mostly over the 20th century. Um, as, as we industrialized farming, as we needed to, to feed the world. Um, but what do we see soils as today? I would argue that over the last 20, maybe 30 years, and at an accelerating pace, we're starting to understand the linkages, the fundamental linkages between soil microbiota and plants in ways that we never would have been imagined in Liebig's day when chemistry was viewed as the driving force in soils. Um, seeing soils as an ecosystem, as a system to be understood and worked with rather than worked against, is, I think, something that could revolutionize agriculture and needs to revolutionize agriculture over the next century. In other words, is soil ecology really the future of agriculture? Uh, I would argue to you that I think it's the key to feeding a post-oil world because we're going to need to learn how to harness the insights of soil ecology to restructure agricultural technology and feed the world based on soil building, ecological processes, and nutrient cycling. We're going to have to learn how to spin the nutrient cycling wheel faster rather than essentially trying to uh, make additions to it uh, on our own. And, and finally, I just want to advertise that uh, healthy soil, we could probably view it as is not really a silver bullet to the world's environmental problems. By no means is it that that, but it could be a secret weapon. Why is it a secret weapon? Well, we're not thinking about it as essentially a weapon for the, the essentially trying to help address climate change, how to feed a post-oil world, and essentially improve public health. And there's, there's sound studies that look at the effects of soil quality and physical, mental, and social health, both in cities and in rural environments. In other words, why would we want to restore soils? Well, for our own well-being. Um, but first and foremost, uh, really, soil restoration means we can no longer treat soil like dirt. And that's the real defense for the title of the book. Um, and I'll leave the last word, really, to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who wrote um, in, right after the Dust Bowl, um, which you'll notice I actually got away tonight with talking about soil erosion in the United States without even mentioning the Dust Bowl till the end. Um, when he wrote that a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. That is as true today at a global level, level and scale as it was at a national level when uh, Roosevelt wrote this. And I think we need to kind of think of soil security, not just on a national level, the way that in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl we started to maybe think and talk about it. We need to think about it on a planetary level, at a species level, because we really fu do fundamentally depend on that as our for the source of our food, and we are quite literally running out of it. Well, I also will shamelessly plug 
Dirt, the book, my first book, uh, King of Fish, A uh, History of Salmon, and uh, my new book, The Rocks Don't Lie, A History of Science and Religion, viewed through how geologists looked at the problem of Noah's flood. And why would I shamelessly plug that to this large an audience? Well, because the bookstore is actually selling them out there. <laughs> They make wonderful Christmas presents. <laughs> um, and I'd be glad to sign them for anybody if you want. And, and I also believe we have time if anyone wants to ask questions. There's a microphone set up. I'd be glad to engage in any questions. And um, if anyone wants to sign me to sign a book, just catch me uh, afterwards. I'll head over there to do that. And I thank you very much for your attendance and your attention. Testing, testing, testing. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, so my name is Miles. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I am a community and regional planning major, so my focus is the urban space. And so I was really fascinated by uh, you talking about how urban density can contribute to the kind of restoration of soils. And that's kind of easy to think about maybe in like a more ancient society density kind of way. What about modern cities, the metropolis, yeah. the metropolis that we build? Kind of how can we, living in cities as urbanites, contribute to the restoration of soils? Well, I think there's a couple ways. I mean, the most, the sort of the grossest and most fundamental level is by returning our own waste back to farms. And I think if you think that the long run, the idea of returning uh, sort of human waste back to environments that we grow food in we're going to get there in a couple hundred years, if only because of phosphorus limitations uh, and their need to recycle that. So I think that uh, at the, the broadest scale, you can sort of think of that. It's probably a little over history's horizon to be basically arguing as an urban planner that let's do that now. <laughs> you know, it's going to take us a while to get to the point where we do that. Um, but I think if we start thinking of cities as not separate from the surrounding countryside and we start thinking about networks of codependent farming communities and cities where there's a flow of dollars that go out of the cities and a flow of food that comes back into the cities, um, thinking about the, engineering those kinds of connections on a design level would be really cool. Um, I look at some of the best farmland in western Washington where I live, and it's been paved over in the last 30 years. Yeah, you know, just as the cities expanded, you know, we don't have a lot of great farmland in western Washington. We have a few really good valley bottoms, and those are the places that have been paved over the fastest. It's utterly insane from a long-term perspective. Um, and so thinking about uh, agricultural land as a societal trust in design processes would go a long ways towards helping that over the long run. There's a period of time when parts of Europe were losing agricultural land at, you know, like a percent a year to basically just paving. Um, so I think thinking about the, uh, the thinking about cities as not connected from the countryside would be a, a major start. Uh, do you discuss uh, ground cover strategies or no-till strategies in your in your book? Um, I, I don't discuss them in detail. Is essentially sort of what you would do for a particular uh, region or piece of ground. What, what I cover in the book is essentially the broad view of why you would do it, how effective it can be, and I review some of the studies that have reviewed those kinds of effects. Um, but the, you know, in, in terms of cutting down on erosion, the best things you can do are ground, you know, cover crops and no-till. And I've been increasingly talking with, uh, with farmers at, at, at presentations I've made uh, who basically are looking at combining cover, till, uh, cover crops and no-till as ways to essentially, th that have been very effective. But again, as a geologist, I would be the last person you would want me to give you specific advice for a particular piece of land. Um, but there are lots of people in every region I've gone to and talked, there's, there's organizations and groups who are focusing on how to do better farming practices, what I would consider better farming practices that would, of that nature. And I would try and connect with people who know the soils and the region and what particular uh, cover crops and what particular practices would be best for, for any particular piece of land. What's the global percent of no-till? Oh, you know, the global percent is probably under 5%. In the U.S., we're up to somewhere between a quarter and a third, depending on sort of what study I've looked at. Um, and it, it varies by region, varies by county. But globally, I think we're less than 5% still. We, we, you know, we have a long way to go. <laughs>
help but, but notice that you mentioned Terra Preto and uh, could you, would you care to elaborate about that and about biochar? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, the, the, the key to the building Terra Preto soils, one of the key inputs was that essentially uh, the, the Amazonian Indians returned their charcoal from their cooking fires back to their land. And so we essentially look at charcoal now as biochar, essentially. If you take any kind of organic matter and you uh, pyrolyze it, you burn it in a low oxygen environment, you can basically turn it into charcoal or biochar. And there's been a number of studies that have looked at increases in soil fertility as a result of adding charcoal to the soil, which some of which have been kind of mysterious because, okay, charcoal is inert. It's like that, that and plants don't suck up the carbon, right? I and mean, they're getting the carbon out of the atmosphere. So how, one of the questions around biochar was why did it make such fertile soils in the Amazon? And why does it work fairly well in some of the, the trials that have been run on it? And the people that introduced me to it are the Seattle Biochar Working Group who are trying to do biochar in an urban agriculture context. Why? Well, we have a lot of organic waste in the city, and you actually can get some energy out of, 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 of combusting organic matter on the way to making biochar. And what it seems to me is essentially the way it works is it essentially creates microbial habitat. You're basically building the environment in which you can essentially build a very uh, a healthy microbial population, and that they're using the charcoal essentially as, as as solid habitat. How solid a view that is, again, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask, that's just my impression. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that seems to be working fairly well. I had uh, breakfast with Bruner uh, Glazer, I believe, in Germany a, couple, a year or two ago, and he was running some uh, uh, test plots of biochar where he would mix charcoal that he had uh, prepared with soils and then look at the corn, I think it was corn and wheat yields he was getting off of it. And he found that he would increase his yields all the way up to like 35% charcoal on his small test plots, and he was complaining that he didn't have the imagination to actually try and using a higher proportion because he didn't think you could actually grow crops in charcoal. Um, so that's a long and only partial answer to your question, I think. I think you covered most of it, although I've read that um, biochar does increase fertility in other ways through its chemical composition, for example, um, cation exchange capacity, it improves. So. Um, thank you. I'm um, curious about the no-till idea because I know that we have some slopes and soils in Iowa where row cropping results in erosion even if no-till is used. And I'm wondering if you've encountered um, places where people have said that part of the solution is figuring out that some areas should be pasture or in permanent vegetation instead of being row cropped. Um, I've definitely run into that, um, that argument and that perception, and I would actually agree with that. I don't know much about any particular geography, but um, I th there are places I think that probably, I mean, in part because I like to eat meat, <laughs> I, I like to think of the idea that we could actually grow livestock in areas as a way um, to restore soil. I've run into some farmers who have been taking some of the grasslands in the Palouse that were that, those winter wheat fields that were eroding so badly, and they've been starting to rebuild soils by reintroducing livestock, and they're basically, run, they're basically feeding the grass-fed beef market in Seattle, um, but restoring the, their, their soils at the same time. And I think there's a lot of room for really creative thinking along those lines. Thank you for mentioning the interface with public policy and suggesting that maybe the starting point is to stop subsidizing practices that don't benefit us long term. I wanted to bring your attention to uh, industrial development in Iowa in case you weren't aware of it. Cellulosic ethanol plants are being built, one in uh, northwest Iowa by uh, Poet and uh, Royal DSM. Uh, in 2014, they need to harvest about one ton of corn stover per acre from 300,000 acres. And their corporate literature says there are no soil erosion problems and not much soil nutrients to worry about. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, there's, <laughs> there's one closer by, by uh, DuPont Pioneer, where they will be harvesting next year uh, two tons per acre of corn stover from about 150 to 190,000 acres. Uh, they are putting a no-take uh, or no contract areas on steeper soils, but they are not in the early years managing for maintaining soil organic matter. 
uh, those are public policy, public subsidy driven yeah. corporate activities and I wanted to um, make sure you were uh, aware of that and, and uh, invite any comments uh, and no, you know about it. I appreciate that. The, um, um, I wrote a little bit about the ethanol, the, essentially the, if the, in DIRT I wrote something to the effect that if we basically, if we convert off of oil to biofuels but do it in a way that erodes the soil, then all we've done is go, we've gone from mining oil to mining soil. Um, and that what we've done is we've sort of changed the time frame in terms of which we're going to run out of something we critically need. So I, I appreciate that. It's a very um, interesting problem. Thank you so much for your uh, speak at, or presentation. And I just have a few questions about some of the issues you talked about. In terms of uh, basically cycling organic matter from urban areas to more agricultural areas, what about transportation? Because you said like in a post, we're going to have to figure this out in a post oil yeah. society. So transportation is going to be huge in that. Yeah, it's, that's going to be a huge issue. And um, it's, it's obviously interconnected to what we use as the transportation of the future because that's, we're going to have that problem independent of the moving food and moving um, uh, waste around. We're going to have it in terms of moving and you know, keeping a functional economy going. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, my, my own favorite sort of off the top of my head, not quite totally serious suggestion would be horses. I just also like horses. <laughs> and then I just have like a question about your thoughts in terms of the um, the time scale for how long it takes before the actions are actually economical for people to actually make these decisions. Um, one of the things that actually uh, lets me occasionally put my optimist hat on is that um, I've run into, since writing Dirt, I've, I've been giving a lot of talks in farming communities, which it surprised me. I, I, I thought originally that the first time I went to talk in eastern Kansas that I might get run out of town when I said that, you know, agriculture had destroyed civilizations. But I actually got uh, quite the opposite response of a lot of farmers who were actually very, very concerned. I mean, as a, subspe as a species, farmers really tend to care about their land from everything that I've, from all the farmers I've met and talked to. I haven't met a single one who basically said, I just want to basically burn this up so I can kid, send my kids to college. I, I run into people who basically are quite connected and have been paying attention and are interested. And the older ones, frankly, tend to have seen longer effects and, and sort of get the argument better because they've seen it play out. Um, and so one of the things that allows me to put my optimist hat on is, is how many farmers I've actually run into who have basically said that, well, they have converted to no-till in part in, because it saves them on their input costs, it's, it, it reduces erosion, but they can make it pay. It can actually pencil out in ways that um, are of immediate benefit to them. And I had, uh, um, I mean, basically I think that the fundamental problem has been in the past that many, in, that I write about in DIRT is that many of the incentives for farmers in an individual year encourage them to practices that can't be sustained over the long run. If we actually get to the point where the incentives in an every given year are aligned with the long-term interests um, for in preserving soil, then we have a much better chance of actually pulling it off. Um, and I see that as, you know, if you think about what's going to happen to the price of oil over the next century, you know, in terms of conversion to alternative agricultural methods and techniques, the higher the price goes, the faster, the better. Now, there's a whole lot of other coupled economic problems that, that might engender that I'm not trying to argue that I'm advocating that we jack it through the roof tomorrow morning. Um, but if we can be sure that the price of oil is going up this century, the forces that are going to be coming to bear on farmers over the next 50 to 100 years are going to encourage them to start thinking and adopting um, what we now consider more alternative methods as simply as a result of market-based economics. Um, and that gives me some optimism that, you know, if you look, we've got decades to solve this problem. We don't have centuries. But if we don't solve it for a few years, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, that's later, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and besides, that, it's four and a half billion years from now, the sun will encompass this room and we're all out of business. So. It's <laughs> Anyway, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I encourage everyone to get multiple books, and I'll be glad to sign them for you.